Joining us now to talk a little bit about the uh, recent developments and answer some of our probing questions, uh, doctors Aaron Philpot and Brad Greenberg from Central Regional Medical Center. Good morning, doctors, and thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Good morning. Good to have you with us. And, uh, of course, Megan is here. I, of course. Yes. So why don't, don't you start? I don't start? Miss this for the world. Ladies uh, first. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have seen some talk and some reports on the double and triple masking idea. So what are your guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, I can I can start with that one, Megan. Um, I think it's, it's an interesting topic coming up. I think, first off, not all masks are created equally um, from, you know, the thin... Uh, baklava um, that people are wearing at the ski area or even to the, you know, face mask with holes in it, which is obviously ineffective to um, N95 that are fit tested in medical workers. So there's certainly more protection, obviously, provided on the far scope with the N95 that's fit tested. Um, the devil mask concept, I know Dr. Fauci has been talking about that a little bit as well. Um, and the CDC is not formally recommending it to date just because they are a database organization and um, will await the actual research to demonstrate that this um, does improve or reduce transmission um, from, you know, either you or protect you more. So no clear data on it yet, but I think um, we as a country are a little bit behind compared to you know, other Asian countries, their masks are kind of the mainstay. Um, and even some countries are giving masks out to the public, high quality medical grade masks to help reduce transmission. We're not quite there yet, obviously, but I think two, um, two masks, the idea there is that you have um, increased uh, protection against transmission. So you're more likely to contain your droplets, which may contain the virus. Um, even if you're asymptomatic, given the risk of asymptomatic transmission with coronavirus. And it also may provide some additional protection, um, filtration against others or, you know, against getting infected. So no clear data yet, but I think intuitively it makes sense um, at this point. Anything to add on that, Dr. Greenberg? I think that uh, we're still trying to find the just – the right combination of PPE that is easy to wear um, and and also effective. I mean, one thing, we, I think that those of us that wear N95 masks for uh, hours and hours and hours every day understand that they're not comfortable and they're challenging to wear. And so putting everyone in the country on an N95 mask may, may result in less folks wearing masks too. So it's really trying to find a sweet spot where folks will wear the mask, which is so important, um, but then also providing the most effective kind of, of masking. And so we'll continue to try to refine our guidance. Right now, I'd, I'd feel very happy if people were wearing uh, some kind of uh, face mask, um, really in any setting when they're outside of their own home or bubble, um, and, uh, and, and, or by themselves, of course. Um, and I think that that would be uh, the most important thing is please wear something. The science behind mask use is uh, is pretty darn solid, and uh, we'll continue to try to provide refined guidance. And if and when we need to turn up the volume on the, the type or use of masks, we will um, make sure those recommendations are made public. Very good. Thank you, doctors. I wanted to ask you both, too, a little bit about the vaccine news and, of course, um, the vaccines are being rolled out across the country, across the world, but we're seeing some of these variants of the virus as it mutates, which is typical of what viruses do, right? And uh, we, we shouldn't be surprised by that. Um, but I know the concern is, you know, as these viruses maybe, as this virus mutates, does that affect the uh, effectiveness of the vaccines that are that are being rolled out? Can you give us some insights on that? Sure. Yeah. I can, uh, talk oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Dr. Greenberg, why don't we start with you? Thank you. Ab absolutely, sure. So we're following the so so. Um, you're absolutely right, Scott. It, it very uh, variations and mutations within viruses occur naturally, and um, so having some degree of variation in uh, the genetic structure of the virus and sometimes the way that it actually responds to the environment is a normal part. When you have a pandemic where you have millions of folks getting infected, 
you're absolutely going to have some degree of mutations. And some of those mutations are going to be favored uh, from a natural selection standpoint, and then they will become like a dominant strain in a specific geographic region. And so that's really what's happened. And the three uh, large, the three larger scale variants that we're continuing to follow include that which uh, start, uh, occurred in the United Kingdom, uh, one in South Africa, and one in Brazil. And um, the, of course, we're we're always concerned about whether or not the therapeutics, including the vaccinations, are going to remain effective. Um, despite the uh, uh, mutations that are associated with these variants. Um, and uh, there has been some uh, – oh, the, other, the other thing that we all are also concerned about is uh, our laboratory test sensitivity with mutation as well. We want to make sure that we're still able to detect these, uh, even though they may be a little bit different. So when it comes to uh, the therapeutics and the vaccination in particular um, – it looks like the uh, vaccinations that are on the market, Pfizer and Moderna, are uh, both companies have basically stated that, that they're largely protective against the UK variant. Um, and then they also stated that there's, there may be partial protection, but perhaps not as much against the, uh, the South Africa variant. Uh, I'm not sure, Dr. Philpott, have you seen, I haven't seen any of these particular um, information related to the Brazilian variant. Yeah, I think the um, the both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine trials were not were obviously done earlier when um, these variants weren't present. So the highly very high efficacy level um, was in the absence of these variants. I think the from what I understand, and there's no clear data to date, is that there's probably it's probably less effective against the Brazil variant, um, but but not you know there's not, there's still some protection. Great. And I have a, a follow-up question about the Johnson and Johnson single dose vaccine that there's a lot of talk about. What about that one? Yeah. And that, that's a good segue because that has been more recently undergoing um, these three trials. Um, and so therefore has been around in the presence of these new variants. Um, the J&J vaccine or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is, has been found to be about 66% effective against moderate um, to severe COVID um, and then 85% effective against severe COVID. So it sounds like they are planning to submit for their, I believe they're going to uh, submit this week for the, their EUA. Um, it's, it's a little bit different mechanism and compared to the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, it uses an adenovirus vector, uh, which is a attenuated common cold virus and it carries the, um, basically the genetic information for the spike protein and, um, works similarly to stimulate your body to make those antibodies and, um, and immune, uh, response to protect you against coronavirus. Um, they, it's been tested. Um, as I mentioned, since the start of the new vi the viruses and in looking at the moderate to severe COVID in, for example, South Africa versus the United States, the efficacy is a little bit lower. I believe it was around 58% in South Africa and then higher in the United States, which is, I believe, around 72%, um, which I think just tells us that there was probably the, the new, the B1351 um, South African variant. Um, in there when they were doing the testing. Um, so still provides protection, not quite as good as the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine. But as we know with flu, um, our deaths, uh, our annual flu deaths, even with a poor match season, go down dramatically. So I don't think anyone should be turned off if, um, if they are offered the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in the future. I think any vaccine providing um, you know, decent efficacy is is fully worthwhile. Thank you. Dr. Greenberg, anything to add? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think that one thing I'd like to feel folks to be reassured by is that the um, viral vector or adenovirus-based um, vaccinations have been used before. They've been used in some really um, fascinating, rapidly developed revolutionary vaccines like the Ebola vaccine. Um, but also, so, so that's a and, and the tests that they've been doing for this really are extensive. They've gone through uh, the full set of, of uh, phase three trials and the data being presented um, it, with the EUA application will be very interesting to review. Um, but I think that it's important for everyone not to be 
uh, confused or turned off by uh, um, efficacy numbers that can be somewhat confusing. Like Dr. Philpott said, if the vaccines are available, um, they've been demonstrated to be safe and they've been demonstrated to be effective. Um, and so I would encourage if, uh, if there comes a time where you have to pick and choose between these particular vaccines, really any of them that are available uh, would be good. I mean, live, we, we don't give live attenuated um, uh, vaccines to certain subsets of um, uh, patients, like immunosuppressed patients, whatnot, but largely um, uh, these vaccines are, are great for the whole population. Um, one thing that's a note is that the, the Johnson Johnson vaccine is, is go, should be available for folks that are 18 years and older. The Pfizer vaccine itself is recommended for those that are 16 and older. And the Moderna vaccine is for 18 and older, but they are doing a subset, uh, I guess, a study at this time for those that are between the ages of 12 and 17. So much uh, will continue to change uh, with vaccination uh, for COVID. And uh, we'll, we'll try to stay on top of it. And we'll, um, you know, the most important thing is try to figure out how to get uh, whatever vaccines are available into the arms of our local community. And um, so there's many, uh, many, many different uh, opportunities for folks to get vaccinated in our community. Um, highly recommend for folks to sign up at vaccinenm.org um, to uh, sign up for uh, getting a vaccination and uh, they will contact you and you'll be assigned a location. So highly recommend uh, getting vaccinated uh, for COVID in whatever form is available. Good advice, Dr. Greenberg. Thank you. And I wanted to ask you both, and maybe Dr. Greenberg, we'll start with you on maybe looking down the road um, a bit as we learn to maybe live with COVID if there is no necessarily cure, but we have these vaccines that reduce the symptoms or protect us against um, some of COVID. Could there then be maybe an annual booster or an annual type of inoculation like an annual flu shot that maybe would address whatever variant or mutation of, of COVID is running around the globe at that, at that time? Do you foresee maybe that? as our future, Dr. Greenberg? Well, great question, Scott. You know, I actually think that the science is still out on that. You know, I think that um, we, and these are the questions that uh, lots of us are asking, and we're asking folks at the state, and we're asking folks at the CDC, and the answer is we don't quite know yet. Um, I think that it does sort of logically follow suit that perhaps a booster would be required. We don't actually know what the duration of immunity conferred by vaccination is at this time. It looks like it's nine plus months, but the plus is really sort of fuzzy. And those folks that got this uh, vaccine initially, they're still being followed over time to see what the magnitude of their um, uh, uh, the antibody and cellular immunity response might be over time. And as far as like uh, perhaps looking at boosters, so to speak, for variants, uh, pharmaceutical companies are also looking at that. I believe that um, they're looking at, uh, I, I do not recall if it's Pfizer or Moderna, but one of those companies is looking at a specific booster for the South Africa variant to see, uh, and basically to um, tailor how uh, the immune response can also need to be sculpted as we uh, see evolution of the virus itself. So great question. Um, don't have a discrete answer yet, but those are those are the questions that we're all wondering about. And uh, when we have some good answers, and we will we will get them right to you. Appreciate that. And just to be clear, though, that uh, even even with the current vaccines that we have, any of them would offer some protection against any of these variants. That's what we understand, at least. And I, and I do have a follow up question. If if I have already had COVID, which and by I don't mean me personally, I just mean you know speaking on behalf of those who have. Um, you recovered from COVID. Recovered, right. Uh, yeah, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, if one has already had COVID, um, do they need to get the vaccine? Or, I mean, maybe we don't prioritize those people. Is there some sort of system like that? Yeah. So the recommendation is, uh, oh, um, go ahead, Dr. Philpott. Um, the recommendation is basically, so there's no harm in getting the vaccine if you've already had COVID. We think the durability of the vaccine is probably... Um, or could be longer. Um, so 
really the, the guidance is more of an altruistic guidance of, you know, we do know if you've had COVID, you recover from COVID, you have at least a 90-day period where you will be highly unlikely to get COVID again, that your body has um, immune protection against recurrent infection. It may be even up to six months, a newer study showed, um, and then at, it could be even longer than that. So the idea is if uh, vaccines are available as we roll this out to the general public and all the high-risk people, that you could reserve, you could kind of get in the back of the line, so to speak, given you have some protection. However, as I said, there's no certainly no harm in doing it if the vaccine's available um, to get. So that's kind of the recommendation to date. It's important, though, however, if you do have an active COVID infection, that you are through your full um, your full quarantine or your full self-isolation, rather, period um, before you present to get the vaccine as to not to expose the others. Right. That makes sense. And one final question for you, too. Um, schools are reopening. What are our thoughts on that and any wisdom on that? If I was a parent sending my kiddo to school or a teacher, what do you guys have to say to that? If I could, um, can I piggyback on to Dr. Philpott's yes. answer for the previous question? Yes. Um, I, I think that one thing that folks are asking is, well, what does that, what does that mean for me? Like, and when can I get my vaccine? And if, if I've had COVID um, or if I get COVID after my first vaccine, and I have to go in for a second one, when can I go back for my second one? Um, and there was some initial guidance that said wait 90 days. And now essentially that, that guidance is no longer the, the current guidance. The current guidance is that um, if you have a COVID infection, um, you need to wait your 10 days um, from the onset of your symptoms plus uh, another three or four days. So 10 days until you're no longer contagious, plus you have to have no fever and you have to have uh, symptoms that are reducing over time for another two to three days. So roughly a rule of thumb would be 14 days from your, the day of onset of your, of your symptoms. And then based on vaccine availability, the recommendation is get the vaccine. So you don't have to wait for 90 days, um, although immunity is thought to, to last for at least that long. Um, so, uh, I think that, uh, that's, that's the important thing. And then if you get it between the first and the second doses, you can still get the second dose. You just may have to reschedule. So it's 10 days plus say two or three days or roughly two weeks from the onset of your symptoms. So I think that's Im important for folks to know is that yes, get the vaccine. Um, it may have to be delayed a little bit, but it doesn't have to be delayed a lot. Um, and there's still a benefit associated with getting the vaccine. Great. Thank you. And, and do you want to touch on schools, Dr. Greenberg? Absolutely. So um, there, there's been some, uh, at least within, within the United States and also some within Europe, you know, uh, I would say that a lot of this guidance sort of predates uh, the variants and some of the changes that have occurred since the variant um, presentation within uh, continental Europe. But basically, it looks like the United States experience has been such that with adequate precautions, meaning with adequate masking, social distancing, et cetera, um, and with adequate precautions, the uh, spread of COVID within schools has not been, uh, well, has not been widespread. And so there's a, there's a movement, you know, throughout the, I mean, everyone recognizes how important it is for um, uh, both students and also members of the workforce to, to have uh, schools available for the ongoing education of children. Um, and I think that uh, largely, if the schools are able to present a uh, well-formulated plan, which is, uh, takes in principles of social distancing, masking, hand hygiene, et cetera, um, and, the, and often there's very creative, process, uh, creative uh, learning models with uh, uh, distance learning mixed with cohorts and hybrid learning, et cetera, um, then schools can be a safe environment for children. And so right now across the country, uh, school districts are, are doing their best to build those really good plans to make sure that students are able to return to school, um, even in the context of the pandemic. But I think that it's important, and it's not just a wholesale return to how things were. It really requires a lot of work and well-thought-out planning to make sure that all those principles uh, can be continued in the school environment to assure the safety of the children and the faculty at each school. Great. And Dr. Philpott, do you have anything to add? 
Yeah, no, I think uh, Dr. Greenberg covered most of it. I will say just an observation from the hospital is um, what a remarkably little amount of influenza, um, RSV, and all the other usual winter respiratory viruses that we're seeing, um, which I think is a very good um, demonstration of the effectiveness of these simple measures, which are just um, masking, hand hygiene, um, and staying home when you're sick. So hopefully we'll continue to see that um, as schools reopen um, with all these measures in place. But it's, it's really fascinating. We have very little, um, very little other things in the hospital um, beyond COVID um, in terms of pneumonia and respiratory viruses. So, um, so it works. So keep, keep it up even with the schools reopening. A little bit of a silver lining if there was one. So thank you both of you very much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it.